Hi, long time no see. 64. So let's fix that now. 1990, let's go. Outlaw AK-1 that is basically a gun smoke clone. And as these go, it's pretty darn fun, even if not overly complicated in its design. Kinda like me, I look like someone to have fun with, but I'm mostly definitely not a complex dude. But put me in front of the screen, give me something to drink and a promise of fried bacon and ask me about fallout or complicated moral or philosophical problem and we'll have stuff to talk about for the rest of the night. So, Outlaw is a vertically scrolling shooter set in the wild wild and let me highlight it once more, wild west. You're a gun for hire, a sharpshooter, a cowboy with no cows to care for, but two guns and a heart for justice and you have to track down and bring for Desperados to justice. Now, the bringing part is a bit far-fetched and imaginary as you'll be convincing them and hundreds of their goons to step down and lay their arms using series of unbeatable arguments delivered by accurate bullets to the heart. Sometimes to the head, but you know, potato potato, bullet to bulato. And yeah, I care very little for these last two words not existing. Now they do. You can hunt down the bodies in any order you'd like, though at first play it's advisable to go in order from the lowest reward one to the highest to familiarize yourself with the gameplay loop. When you manage to convince them all to grab some eternal Z's, a fifth target emerges and he's the last challenge of the game. Well, when you get to him through his numerous henchmen that is. As you keep playing, dancing through the gobs of bullets constantly going your way and turning the wild west just that little less wild with each of your shots, you should also aim at the barrels if you see any, as they may contain useful items. Stuff like extra speed, better shooting range or dynamite clearing the screen of all enemies. These may not seem like much, but are really helpful and you should never ignore them. All that said, Outlaw is just a little bit difficult, which may be an issue for some, but it's okay for me. I like a little challenge but get easily discouraged by an uphill battle, so Dying 3, 4, 5 times in a row is something I can accept, but if it's way more then I'm just out of there. Is it too difficult for you? Hard to tell, but you should definitely take it for a spin and see if its loop is something you'd enjoy. Creatures is a side-scrolling action platformer and one of the most impressive games in the genre on C64. It's also full of various different creatures, as you'd expect, but the name of the game has actually absolutely nothing to do with them. And Creatures actually stands for Clyde Radcliffe exterminates all the unfriendly, repulsive, air-freedom slime. Because you know, you playing as Clyde will exterminate that is. But let's start at the beginning. You and your fellow fuzzy wazzies are traveling the space after leaving your home planet of blood, seeking a new place to party on. I mean, live on, but also party a little too. Like no more than five, six times a week, really. And as you go through empty vastness of space, avoiding Earth like the plague, because you know, we have wars and stuff, an asteroid collides with your colony ship and it crash lands on our blue marble. Fortunately, it does on an uncharted island, which you quickly populate claiming your own and completely ignoring any international borders. Unfortunately, however, the island seems to already be populated by some kind of demons that don't take well to your arrival. So they capture your brethren by luring them into a trap disguised as a party, which is a pretty dick move if you ask me, and you're the only one that managed to escape captivity. How did you do that, you may wonder? Well, you were in the bushes, extruding all the alcohol that you've induced, suffering a slight poisoning. As you wake up the next day and figure out what's what, you vow to find the demons and kick their asses. Well, men also rescue your friends, but finding and kicking takes the precedence, and you'll be doing that first. Creatures is built out of three levels, each split into three stages. The first two are always side-scrolling platformers, in which you have to explain to all the demons why they've made a mistake by burning them alive with your fiery breath. And since Ghost Peppers is all you live on, you can bet your sweet ass that the fire that hits them is something even their hell-spawned asses are not used to. Third stage is set in a T-O-R-T-U-R-E chamber and takes up a whole screen not scrolling. It's a puzzle stage where you must use the items in it to figure out a way to save your friend and kill the demon hurting him slash her. I really can't tell the genders of these fuzzy wuzzies, perhaps they have none, or all of them rolled into one, who knows, not me. So let's just stick to him slash her. Between the levels you get to meet up with the witch to exchange magic portion creatures collected while playing for either new attack patterns, a boost to your current attack or hints on how to beat the closest third stage. Now, I know I've been telling you about demons and such all this time, but if you look at the enemies, they actually look pretty cute. So maybe we've been misled here and you're the one who's committing mass killings by hunting down colorful creatures and frying them into kebab for no reason. Think about it. Blood Money is a port from the Amiga and a horizontally and vertically scrolling shoot-em-up presented in a R-type-like side view. 
Upon its original release on Commodore's Big System, it was an instant hit and a game that was beloved by many, both for technical excellence and gameplay alike. This years later C64 port is no different and probably even more technically impressive given the limitations of the 8-bit architecture. The scrolling is super smooth on both axes, never slowing down or jerking, it just flows, while the screen is overflowing with the enemies all going at you as if you were the death incarnate itself. There's dozens of sprites on the screen at once and the game never really charts. I wouldn't say that it runs lightning fast, but it's very fluid and comfortable. What's even more impressive is that it can be played in simultaneous multiplayer, not only making Blood Money a more fun experience, but even more hectic and action-packed. With so many objects at the screen moving so fast, one can wonder what the cuts are, and what had to suffer for it all to look so sleek. And the logical conclusion is the collision detection. It had to be simplified, not to overstretch already steaming C64 CPU. And you know what? It's not the case whatsoever. It's pixel perfect and never fails to detect a hit, and in the same time never reports false positives. It's just great. The enemies are really varied and animated, as opposed to being just static sprites, and they fit nicely in the over-encompassing sci-fi-esque aesthetics. Bosses that you get to tackle from time to time are rather big, interestingly designed and fun to figure out the patterns of too. Blood Money is composed out of four rather large levels, each of taking between 15 and 25 minutes to beat, provided you know how and are skilled enough to do it, that is. As you kill all the bodies, you'll collect money along the way, which then can be spent in shops, strategically placed around the stages, to purchase various power-ups. Playing with a friend makes the game noticeably easier, but also makes you decide who's to pick up and spend the money, as there's not twice as many droppings. You will either share them equally, or the two-player game may soon turn into a single-player one again. All in all, Blood Money looks, sounds and plays fantastic, and is easily one of the more technically impressive games of its time on C64. If you like shooters, make sure to to check it out, if you don't care for them, it may be worth a look anyway, as it's, as it's a truly unique feeling one. Champions of Krim is SSI's first in the famous Dragonlance Gold Box series of AD&D RPGs. It is widely considered a staple of the computer role-playing genre and one of the most important titles ever made. And C64, despite being a granddaddy of a system by 1990, got its own excellent port of it. The plot follows your party's quest of finding and defeating the evil Mertini and his supporters, who by ambushing innocent settlers a little earlier, proved that neither him nor his forces of evil are as weakened and unimportant as it was presumed. That's the short of it. And the long too, as it's literally just a tiny bit more complex than that. But back then, all you needed as a motivation to embark on an adventure were the amazing gameplay mechanics, fun storyline and a villain dangerous and worth putting down. Mertini was definitely one. Champions of Kryn's story, even if initially simple, slowly gets better the longer you play. You start by creating a party of up to six adventurers, building them from a staple AD&D, Dragonlands races and professions. And if they manage to survive the story of the game, with you behind the wheel, they can be imported in the follow-up Death Knights of Kryn, to keep improving and having new and exciting adventures. So make sure to pick well, as these may be your chosen heroes for many, many hours and games. The most unique feature of Champions of Kryn and really all other gold box titles too was the fact that while the traversal was in first person 90 degrees turning tile based mode, very familiar to gamers back then, combat encounters took place on a flat top down viewplane where each of the player's characters was controlled individually in turns. It made those battles much more tactical than in other similar games and it took many environmental objects and obstacles into account, letting you get lost in the strategy of planning out your combat encounters in intricate detail to cause as much damage as possible to as many enemies as you can while sustaining minimal losses yourself. Naturally, it only sounds easy and simple and is anything but. Set battles are definitely a highlight of Champions of Kryn. While all SSI's RPGs of the time may be a bit difficult to stomach for a modern gamer, they are no doubt important titles in the history of gaming, and definitely still fun to play if you overcome the first impressions that may initially feel a bit alienating in 2024. The Amazing Spider-Man is a title that's easy to put you off at the first glance. Well, first play even. It doesn't feel very Spider-Man-y for the lack of a better word when you first launch it, it moves slower than you'd like it to, especially as Spidey's game should be action-packed, and the controls take a minute to learn and another 9 to master. So 10 minutes is what you need to get over the first impression and figure out that there's actually a little gem hidden here under the whole initial shock. If you decide to stick to it however, bad pun intended, and carry on playing, you'll begin appreciating the game for what it is. And it is much more than it seems. It's an arcade platform puzzler that puts a bit more focus on the puzzling than the action. 
which is not that bad actually, as it lends itself to be more replayable and enjoyable experience. Mysterio has kidnapped Mary Jane, soon to be Mary Jane Watson Parker, and holds her hidden in a gigantic film studio set. You, playing as everyone's favorite friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, have to save her. So, you head off to find and rescue her. You can naturally walk and climb walls and ceilings and use your web to swing around too. You do not directly fight with the enemies, but can web them to stun them for a little while, which some may consider to be an overlooking on the designer's side, but I think it's a very lore-friendly choice. Spider-Man was incredibly strong and his punches and kicks are best saved for supervillains, while the regular goons, mysterious henchmen, are best incapacitated. I mean, you wouldn't want to send them to the hospital now, would you? The gameplay comprises mainly of going through adjacent screens, solving their puzzles, which are most of the time series of switches. Though sometimes you'll have to deactivate some of the mysterious more interesting gimmicks, like a reverse gravity thingy or sliding floors for instance, there's a lot and it's all fun. The enemies will get in your way, but stunning them with your web is plenty enough to stop them. It has to be mentioned though that on some of the screens they can be stopped permanently, be it by dropping a rock on them or having them fall into a pit. The Amazing Spider-Man is actually amazing, if you let yourself take it for what it is and not what you want it to be. And if you do, you'll quickly fall in love with it, its high resolution graphics, super smoothly animated characters and interesting mechanics and problems to solve on all of its screens. If you've never played it, definitely give it a chance. I've not played Chips Challenge on C64 when it originally released and to be honest I only did years later through emulation, but I think that I would have enjoyed it immensely if I did when I still had my C64. So when I finally got to it, it was already a well-known game considered a retro classic on all systems it came out on. In Chips Challenge, surprise surprise, you play as Chip, a teen nerd that wants to join his school's computer club, aptly named Beat Busters, like Ghostbusters but hunting bugs in code and not green slimers. Since spots in the club are limited, however, and only the smartest of the smart can join, Melinda the Mental Marvel, who's even more aptly named than the club itself, and also de facto club's leader, tells Chip that he'll need to solve a series of riddles to prove that his intelligence is sufficient to be allowed in. She devises an initiation test composed out of a series of increasingly more difficult puzzles, 149 of them to be precise, and in each you have to collect all chips scattered around, avoid enemies, cross the hazards, and then get to the exit. Some of the levels are logic-based, others require figuring out combinations of switches or just avoiding of the deadly traps, and some are purely dexterity and fast reaction centered and see you sprinting for the exit as fast as you can. And many are a mix of all these. Chips Challenge is a very player-friendly title in that it offers unlimited lives, so even if you fail in certain more complicated levels a few times, trying out different strategies, it will not impede your progress and you'll be able to repeat your attempts until you find the solution. Despite the very simplistic presentation, Chips Challenge was critically acclaimed and to this day is considered one of the best puzzlers ever released, at least in terms of the fun factor. Have you ever wanted to be a superhero? To save the day? To beat the villain and rescue damsels in distress? Well, men in distress too, but it just doesn't sound as grandiose. Well, I'm happy to report that you may be finally given a chance to do so, cause Superkit puts you in the warm hug of a superhero cape made out of old and smelly blanket and sets you off to do just that. Funny enough, our hero, despite being a kid, does kinda look like an overweight 8 year old. Just look at him. But don't let the looks fool you, he's more than able, trust me. And you'll be controlling him all the way through his heroic adventure. Super Kid is an action flip screen platformer set in New York. And New York is not a safe place in this game's reality of 1990. It's filled with criminals, thieves and killers, probably pimps too, but pimps are not bad, they're just doing what needs doing, they're providing a service. Or so I heard. Overall though, the city is in chaos, the mayor is powerless and no number of police officers seems to be able to bring peace back to the Big Apple. You're Tom Essex and you're a drunk. Wait, what? No, uh, sorry, I meant, and you've drunk a scientific formula created by your crazy ass mad scientist of an uncle and gained real impressive powers. First of all, you can fly, which in a city like New York is hella important. I mean, have you seen Manhattan and how jammed it can get? Also, very, very tall buildings everywhere. Secondly, you've been granted a powerful punch. I mean, not powerful enough to shatter a building, but strong enough to knock someone out. Like, with one punch. Maybe. You know those arcade punch power testing machines that go from 1 to 999? Imagine this. Your punch is so powerful, you're nearly always hitting easily above 300. And if you think that's not much, I'd like to remind you that you play as a kid. Super kid, not Superman, you know. So, 
300 is nothing to scoff at. And last but not least, the final and unquestionably biggest power you've been granted is the uncanny ability to open most, like 9 out of 10 peanut butter jars, no matter how tight they are. Impressive, right? And with those abilities at your disposal, you are the guardian of New York. The game is composed out of 6 levels, so 3 parts of the city during the day and then the same ones at night and completing each of them requires you to fulfill a certain quota of rescues. So you fly around punching bodies, saving women trapped on rooftops and escorting grannies across the street. Sounds ridiculous perhaps, but since no supervillains exist in Super Kid's world, that's what you're after. Super Kid is a pretty enjoyable little arcade game that's perhaps not the best thing to hit the C64, but it's fun for what it is and definitely worth a couple of playthroughs. Space Harrier 2 was a Sega Genesis original. Now, let that sink in. It was a game that released on Sega's 16-bit console and then was ported down to a lowly C64. That's something. And a testament to popularity and longevity of the system, no less. While on Genesis, first Space Harrier was easily a better game, being faster, more psychedelic and demanding, on C64, the opposite was the case. Commodore's first Space Harrier, regardless if it was European or US release, cause yeah, there were separate two, was not great. Not broken in any way, mind you, just nowhere near the quality you'd expected from it. The second, however, was much better, smoother, faster and more fun, even if many of the enemies and bosses were recycled from the first game. Once again, you're Space Harrier and once again you have to save the fantasy land. So, alone, you have to face thousands of different enemies spread over a dozen or so of decently sized fast running stages, flying ahead and shooting everything that comes your way. In fact, that's how it could be summarized. You fly into the screen and kill everything. If it's there and moving, shoot at it is what I'm saying. Now, this may seem like a repeatable formula and one that should grow old fast and yet somehow it's fun all the way through. When all stages are beat, the last final 13th emerges in which you're facing all the previously defeated bosses one by one and finally a Dark Harrier himself, your evil counterpart. It is worth mentioning and highlighting here that despite C64 being a rather old boy by 1990, the conversion didn't omit anything and all the enemies and 13 unique bosses are present in the port and as tactically challenging as they originally were. It's a must play. While C64 may not be the system you think of first when flight combat simulations are a subject of discussion, it managed to surprise me numerous times with quality and depth of the titles in the genre that it received. An F-16 combat pilot is no exception. In fact, by some, it is considered as the best game in the genre on Commodore's system that could. And it could indeed. As there's so much content packed in this one, you wouldn't believe possible. To the point that playing F-16 Combat Pilot without the manual, unless you had some serious fight under your belt already, was very difficult. There was just way too many different buttons on the keyboard responsible for different functions, that memorizing them all on the first few playthroughs was highly unlikely, and forgetting about most of them would often lead to your premature landing, usually in a blaze of failure. So stuff like flaps, jamming pods, gear retraction, flares, seven weapon mounts and numerous other things were adding a lot to the realism and difficulty alike and all required manual controls. F-16 Combat Pilot can be played as single missions or a campaign composed out of series of these. The objectives of each are rather varied and could be anything from dogfights through reconnaissance of enemy controlled areas to ground and air target strikes. Missions usually take between 10 minutes and an hour, depending on the number of targets, their difficulty, base you are flying from and your skill, which in 1990 on C-64 made you feel like a real maverick in Top Gun on a real long ass assignment even if flying an entirely different plane. It's worth noting that picking a base to start from and your F-16 slowdown was entirely up to you and a lot of fun too, customizing your plane for the challenge ahead according to the mission's objectives. While doing so correctly required a bit of familiarity with the game, it was not necessary as a standard loadout, while not perfect, was rather universal. Now, I'm not great at flight combat simulations and this one's no different, but I can appreciate it for what it is and I know for a fact that most C64 owners who like these loved F-16 Combat Pilot. Despite what others may tell you, I consider Terry Khan to be the second best shooter on C64, only bested by its direct and superior sequel. It released in a time when 16-bit systems were already overtaking the market and less and less devs looked to release their games on rapidly aging hardware. And when it dropped, it may have not looked 16-bit, but by god, it definitely felt 16-bit while playing. Starwise, you're Terrican, a bioengineered mutant warrior created for the task of planetary reclamation. And you're sent off to planet Altera, artificial man-made world in a nearby galaxy that was abandoned by humanity ages ago. 
It was kept running by the Morgul, so multiple organism unit link, a powerful ecosystem generation network that corrupted over the years, rebelled against humans and filled five continents of the planet with deadly machines. It's up to you to set things right, whatever means necessary, which as it's easy to guess means whooping some serious ass. Terrican is a platformer shooter hybrid in a side view perspective, so a game we would have called a Metroidvania today. And in a typical Metroidvania fashion, it features huge ass levels filled with tons upon tons of secrets, hundreds if not thousands of enemies overflowing the screen at most times, and a good selection of 10 weapons and power ups to utilize to put all of these enemies to sleep. Like forever. You know, sleep that they would never wake up from. The further you get in the game, the bigger the stages will be and the enemies will be more varied and using different weapons. The end level bosses are interestingly designed too, fun to figure out their patterns and eventually defeat. Initially, when you play it first, Terrican may seem a bit overwhelming with the sheer number of enemies on the screen, often going right for you, but as soon as you learn the loop of it, how the weapons work and that you can hold the fire button to turn your fire into a plasma whip, that you can wave around annihilating everything around you, it will become much easier and much more manageable. So, with practice comes perfection and soon enough it will be the bosses and the timer that will be the biggest challenge. That second especially, cause while it may seem to be very generous initially in time as you start scouting around the gigantic areas looking for extra lives and other pickups, it will become painfully obvious that it's barely enough to do everything that you have to before it runs out. Terrican sounds and graphics are both excellent and state of the art for what the C64 was capable of, all running super smoothly, never really slowing down, even for a second. Which given the sheer number of sprites on the screen at times is hella impressive actually. Terrican excels at everything that it does and in my opinion, along with its sequel, is one of the best shooters ever made. And yes, I mean on any system. Don't waste any more time, go and play it. It's been a while since we spoke about C64, but I think that these 10 games more than made up for it. All are interesting for one reason or another and all are worth replaying. It's a good start to 1990, but we'll see how things will fare in the next few episodes. For now though, if you liked the episode, let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below, and maybe share it too, it helps more than you know. If you didn't, then don't naturally. It was fun talking to you as usual, and I'll see you, or more accurately, talk to you very soon.